usually use the vent reload tester, but this kind of gives you more uh, real world experience of where you can or test an alternator's output given your basic tools like a digital multimeter. Now, you don't have to have a fancy one like this. You can have a cheap Harbor Freight one and be just as effective. So what we're really measuring here is voltage output. So let's talk about what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a state of charge test of the battery. We're going to start the vehicles and we're going to see what the alternator is capable of producing with no loads. Once we've established what our voltage output is with no loads, then we're going to talk about adding loads to the circuit in order to put a uh, well, make that alternator start working, make it earn its keep. If it can't keep up with demand, we know the alternator can't provide the power necessary to both operate electricity and electronics and charge the battery. So our goal today will be just to do some simple tests that you could do with a cheap multimeter to evaluate an alternator's output locate where our alternator is. It's not always in the easiest place to reach or get to or even really service. So on this Saturn kind of uh, illustrates the example really well. It's not right out in the open. If we look at this engine bay, you can see that we've got an AC compressor here. We've got some uh, emissions components here. We've got a power steering pump here. But when we try to look for other things like our water pump down there, crankshaft pulley and idler and then way down here that little pulley you see there that's our alternator so we can reach around back and you can see it and um, typically your alternator is going to be a uh, aluminum housing device usually it has these these fins here allow air into it there is this black section here that looks like it's kind of segmented that is the uh, outside kind of a cooled portion of our stator and we have a back cap area and then we have connections typically across the back now the alternator is usually aluminum because during the lesson we should have learned that it is essentially creating an electromagnet um, the field coil inside creates a magnet and then it opposes the um, current flowing through the windings or uh, I'm sorry it induces current flowing through the windings. So we're creating a magnet. We don't want the housing to become magnetized and start creating its own magnetic field. So the aluminum resists becoming magnetized because it's a non-ferrous metal. And so typically when we look for an alternator, it's the aluminum, usually on most vehicles, kind of dirty, aluminum device attached to our serpentine belt. Now, when we talk about belts and charging systems, the thing we got to keep in mind is this belt is what is actually driving that mechanism. So your charging system is only as good as the actual device that's driving. So obviously you got your crankshaft pulley down here. We've got our belt and we've got a tensioner. Let's see, where is that tensioner? It's down there if you can see that stud. Um, there's a better angle on it. Um, but that tensioner there is what's providing tension so that the belts don't slip. Things like your water pump, um, your power steering pump, your AC compressor, and your alternator all create resistance that the engine has to overcome. So if the belt were to be uh, loose, that tensioner is no longer doing its job, or maybe the actual rubber is degraded on the belt itself, you are not going to be able to efficiently spin your alternator, your power steering pump, your AC compressor, and your water pump so that they can do their jobs. So usually on vehicles that start up and they have a belt squeal, it's usually kind of a, a pointer that you need either a new belt or you need a new belt tensioner and a belt in order to drive your accessories properly. So when we talk about our charging system, obviously a lot of it revolves around our battery and this battery is looking pretty cruddy. Um, I haven't cleaned it in a while. You should clean batteries when they start developing this nasty stuff here. And that's corrosion. Um, it's caused by the outgassing of the battery when it's being charged. And usually it can kind of indicate that maybe a battery is a little bit weaker because it's being charged regularly and creates this gas. Um, one thing we need to establish before we can get too far is actually uh, our state of charge. So in order to get a state of charge, we should measure off of our battery terminals and then actually see what our state is. So I could do that. I could take my, my alligator clips here and go right to these terminals, but they're pretty nasty. So we should probably try to clean the contacts where we're going to be measuring in order to get an accurate read. So if we use a little bit of sandpaper, 
just clean them up a little bit. You don't have to go crazy. Just get some clean material here. We're gonna get a lot better of a read, a little bit more accurate read that won't uh, give us some weird variations. And then that way, there's no hesitation. We can say that the voltage that we see on the screen is more than likely an accurate read. So we're gonna connect our red lead to our positive and our black lead to our negative. We don't have to be too crazy careful here because what we're doing is we're just measuring voltage. We're not really creating any current. And you can see on my screen here that I have 12.55 volts. Pretty good, we're expecting 12.6. Uh, I haven't driven the car in a couple days. So that's actually pretty good. So when we go to test the alternator, with the VAT40, we would use the method of uh, being able to load it down to the um, alternator's rated output and then see if it can produce up to 12 volts for a certain length of time. But uh, in our case, we have to consider that we don't have a way to simulate a load. We only have the actual loads in the electrical system. So in our case here, we've got a fuse box and we can use the information in the fuse box, fuse block to help us out. Um, we can look at the, the fuses, we can say we got a bunch of 30 amp fuses here, a whole bunch of 10s, 15s, another 30, a 25, there's a bunch of different um, circuits here that are being protected, and we can kind of estimate their output based on the rated fuse. Now, something to keep in mind, just because it says 30 amps on it, doesn't mean that there's 30 amps flowing through that circuit. It's up to 30 amps of protection so that we don't burn through wires and overwhelm circuits. The rule is that when we talk about a circuit, let's say this 10, um, that circuit is related to this chart that's here on the inside of the fuse box cover. So when we look at this 10 here, it's this one here and it says AC, 10 amps. So they're saying it can protect up to 10 amps. Now, like I said, it doesn't mean that it's using 10 amps of current. The rule that we typically have is that this fuse is designed to protect 20% um, more than the current's typical rate. So when we say 20% of 10 amps, that is two amps. So it's got two amps buffer room, essentially, some uh, overhead so that the circuit doesn't burn out every single time it hits its rated current. Now. If it's supposed to be 20% above the rated current, that means that this circuit is probably operating around eight amps. So we can kind of use that as our overhead. <clears throat> so um, when we talk about like a 30 amp fuse here, these are typically gonna be running in the range up to, not constantly, but potentially up to 24 amps in any given time. Now we can't control these because when we look at the, when we look at our uh, fuse block cover, we've got things like ignition and we've got instrument panel, uh, we've got ABS system, we've got windows, and these are things that aren't running necessarily all the time. What we wanna be able to do is say that yes, we can operate a lot of the critical components that we need to operate the vehicle at a given time. So things like the, um, oh, let's see, headlamps. Obviously you want headlamps. The headlamps on the left and the right, they both get their own individual fuse and that's these two guys here. And so each of those is rated at 10. Uh, and then that means that essentially when both of these circuits are running, we have approximately 16 amps of current flowing to the headlights all the time. Now there's also other ones like fog lights, which this car doesn't have. Um, there's backup lamps. There are, um, Oh, let's see, where's just the parking lamps? There's another 10 um, for the computer to operate to run the engine. It's another 10. So just kind of adding these up, we can say 8, 16, 24, 32, and about 40 amps if we think about the engine running at that given time. Um, so just in normal operation with the headlights on, parking lights on, and um, the engine running, this system is consuming about 40 amps. Now, if we add into this that we wanna have the injection system running, which we do, there's another eight amps. So now we're up to 48. 
Um, I don't have an automatic transmission. It's a manual, so we don't have to worry about that. But uh, how about a um, <clears throat> oh, like a HVAC fan inside? I don't see that in this fuse block here. It must be on the inside fuse block. But those typically consume quite a bit of amperage. So if we run that, we're probably going to pull 20 amps in high speed. So we had 48 and 20. Now we're up to 68 amps. So we can at least put a decent load against this just by turning on a lot of the accessories that you would normally run on a given time. So that's what we're going to do to simulate the load. So first we're going to start the vehicle up and then we're going to see what our voltage is. We are hoping that it's going to produce more than 12.56, indicating that it's actually producing more power than the battery can produce by itself. Normally, when we talk about an alternator running, we're looking something in the range of 13 and a half volts, maybe 14 and a half, but that might be in uh, really high output circumstances or on vehicles that have a lot of electronics. This little simple car does not have a lot of electronics, and so I'm looking for probably like 13.8, 13.9. So let's start it up and see what it is. And I'm going to try and eliminate any amps or amperage draw as we're doing this test. So right now you can see that we're running at about 14.6 volts of output. Quite a bit more than our 12.55 that we started with. And that's pretty good. So our electrical system right now with no loads applied to it, except for maybe daytime running lamps, which are not on right now. Nope, those aren't applied. We're producing 14.77 volts. Now, this is with no extra accessories running. My engine is just simply running, it's using the fuel pump, it's using the injectors, it's using the um, ignition system, and it's using um, a couple of relays to operate different electrical components. So it's pretty minimal. It's running pretty lean right now without a lot of uh, components sucking power and, and requiring extra juice. But as we add individual loads against this, that'll really tell us the health of our um, alternator. That alternator should be producing relatively high voltage right now because it's charging the battery back up after we've started it. And then it should kind of even out over time. Now, we might not be able to see that in the short time that we're running it, but I do want to show you that when we put a load against the battery, this number shouldn't really fluctuate. This is what the voltage regulator wants to see right now because it knows the battery is a little bit undercharged. So let's start adding accessories in. Let's start adding things like headlamps and uh, make sure that they're the high beams because the high beams have a lower resistance in their circuit and they'll draw more current. Um, I'm gonna turn on the uh, rear defogger grid on my back window. I'm going to install, or uh, not install, but I'm gonna turn the blower speed all the way up to high in order to make sure that we're drawing as much possible power on all of these circuits. Now, if this were to dip, even close to you know 13 volts, that wouldn't be so good. That means we don't have a lot of overhead. We don't have a lot of power that's available to be produced. And the other thing is that we're idling right now. It shouldn't deplete power when you're idling. It should be maintaining gear. The alternator is able to produce more power as it's spinning faster. But just sitting here about 800 to 1,000 RPM, it should produce power enough to charge and uh, charge the battery and operate all of the electronics. So I'm gonna start adding in our loads now. Even turning on things like my dome lights and turning on the AC consumes more power. 
So I'm leaving my door open. I've activated all the lights so they stay on all the time. And all of it is putting a load against that alternator. And as you can see, we're still above 13 volts here. That's pretty good. What we can't actually see here is amperage. But we get a rough idea that it can produce more than enough amperage because our voltage is higher than battery voltage. As the alternator's ability to produce amperage drops, its voltage abilities drop as well. And so under a load, the voltage is gonna drop and drop and drop because it just simply can't produce enough current flow. And so the pressure output of it, if you think of it pushing electrons, also diminishes. So this is pretty good. I like to see this. This is a very healthy alternator. Um, a more accurate way of doing it would be obviously using the VAT40 but it does show us that our alternator is producing enough power to operate all the accessories we can activate, plus the thing is used to run the engine itself. So we'll shut it off and let's go and check out another vehicle. So here's our GMC Yukon. This is a 2008 and um, what General Motors and a lot of other manufacturers did around the same time was that they, they changed the system. Um, instead of it being just a standalone regulator that lives inside of here, that kind of decides what it's going to do and how it's going to charge the battery in a very basic sense. They changed things around so that this is no longer controlled by the uh, voltage regulator solely. The voltage regulator is still in here, but he kind of does what the computer that operates the engine tells it to do. Um, our other vehicle there, the Saturn that we looked at, and another one that we're going to look at, those are older systems. Those older systems typically were, were uh, just a self-contained voltage regulator that said, yep, my voltage is here and I need to be here, and so I'm going to charge at my maximum rate until I get closer, and then I'm going to cut it down to kind of more of a minimum rate. It's a effective system and it does its job, but it doesn't take into account the fact that uh, maybe we can overload the system or maybe we don't need all these systems operating at full capacity because that causes extra strain against the engine and it loses fuel efficiency. All things that uh, you know aren't necessarily what modern manufacturers look for. We want vehicles that are fuel efficient and constantly um, evaluating the circumstances so they can be maximum efficient all the time. So when we start up this vehicle, what we're going to see is something a little bit uh, different than what we saw on the last one. When we start it up, it's probably going to sit there for at least a couple seconds, maybe five seconds tops, up to ten. Um, and it's not going to charge. What it's going to do is you'll see the voltage drop on the screen because you're consuming power with the uh, starter. But then it'll take a minute. It'll kind of re recover back close to what we have here now. Um, and then ultimately it'll kick on and jump up to its maximum voltage. That's actually on purpose, and a lot of people had complaints about that when these systems first came out. There was actually a technical service bulletin that General Motors issued that was telling people, just because it doesn't start charging for a couple seconds after you've started the vehicle doesn't mean there's a problem. People brought them back to dealerships. I worked on a couple of circumstances where we had to tell the customer, hey, uh, not for nothing, but this is normal. This is how the new electrical system works. And the idea is that the computer lets it charge and lets the engine come up to a decent idle before hammering it with a load and then trying to knock it down. It lets it kind of recover and then ease into the charging. Um, and so I'll try to capture it on the uh, dashboard as well because this one has a dashboard mounted voltmeter. Um, and we'll hopefully see it on this screen as well. And after this starts, it will take a couple seconds and then all of a sudden it'll jump to full voltage or ramp up towards full voltage and begin charging the battery. So um, the whole idea is one where the system, the engine can actually turn off different components depending on the state of the battery. So let's say your battery began to fail, it wasn't as healthy as it once was, or your alternator wasn't as healthy as it once was. What your car can actually do is evaluate how much power is being produced here, and it can say, I know how much juice I've got left back in my battery, and my voltage starts getting closer to that 12.6, it knows that this guy's not doing the job. So in order to preserve you and your driving on the road, it can actually start shutting things off, like uh, if you have heated seats. It'll start turning off heated seats. They're called load sheds and they go in different stages. So like stage one will be heated seats and um, it might turn off the air conditioning. Stage two is gets a bit, of more, a bit more aggressive 
and it starts turning off things like um, the blower motor for your heating system. It starts getting rid of things like uh, defogging and stuff in the back window in an effort to try and preserve safety, yes, but necessary safety. Um, it'll never turn the lights off, it'll never do anything like that, but you might start seeing systems start dropping out and then gradually it's going to run out of juice, but it's trying to prevent that from happening for the longest amount of time possible. So let's start by trying to start this vehicle up and we're gonna do a similar tactic. We're gonna do it in more staged um, assembly here where we are gonna think about how much amperage we're drawing when we activate different components, but let's just see what happens when we first start this vehicle up. All right, so we're gonna start this vehicle and I want you to pay attention to this gauge right here. I know you can't see where it is right now, but it's pointing at nine volts. It's just basically it's off position. And then 14 volts is about in the middle. And that's where ultimately it's gonna hover around as we get closer to um, our actual power fully on. So we're gonna start it, got our warning lights to come on, it tells us what our current state of charge is, a little bit more than 12 and we start our vehicle. It's staying down, and then all of a sudden it'll start jumping up and closing in on our 14 volts. In this case, we're going beyond 14 volts. It looks like we're about 14.8, something like that, similar to what we saw on the Saturn when it first started. But after the vehicle starts charging itself and it starts topping up that battery, this will begin to drop again, and it'll get closer to that 14 volts, a little bit more than uh, you know, 13 and a half, it wants to hover around there. So in this vehicle circumstance, it's operating about 15 volts. That's quite a lot. Um, and as you saw when we first started it, it takes a moment before it reaches there, so it doesn't just hammer that engine with a harsh impact, and this thing kind of acts like a brake on the engine. It kind of lets it work its way up to its maximum capacity. And it's kind of an intelligent system that does that instead of just a voltage regulator that says, this is my voltage, this is where I need to be, let's get there now. So um, what we'll do next is we'll start applying loads. I'm gonna start turning on a lot of different things. This is a big vehicle and it has multiple HVAC blowers and it has um, a lot of electronic system. It has uh, the high-end radio in it, so each of the speakers has their own amplifier. So I'm gonna turn that on. Um, I'm going to turn on the rear defog, I'm going to turn on the headlights and the fog lights. Uh, I'm going to do as much as I can to put a burden on the system to make sure that this can actually produce the power, or I'm sorry, this can produce the power that's necessary. So our voltage has dropped, that could be part of adding loads to it. It could also have something to do with the fact that the battery is getting more topped up and it doesn't need to have as much voltage being pushed out of that alternator. In any case, I'm running a lot of different accessories right now and it's not burdening our alternator. Now just to kind of uh, signify how much power this thing actually produces, this alternator is rated at about 140 amps. That's how much power it can produce at maximum capacity, turning about 2,000 RPMs, and it can maintain that while still charging the battery. So it should be able to produce more than 12.6 volts at 140 amp output to operate all of our accessories. Now, my cooling fan's just turned on because the AC is turned on as well, and you probably saw the voltage dip a little bit there, but it kind of stabilized once again at 14.6. So this is seemingly a very healthy alternator. So you can see our voltage is approximately what we would expect. It's dropping gradually and slowly just because there's a little bit of what we would call a surface charge on the battery, but it's right about where we would expect it. It'll continue dropping. It'll probably settle somewhere probably around 12.4. Um, because the battery was a little bit weak to start with. But let's talk about what we actually did. We, we applied a ton of amperage to our vehicle, and if we go by this um, chart here as any indicator of what we put against this thing, I had the cooling fans on. So let's see what the cooling fans are uh, rated at. I can find it on here. 
AC compressor was 10 amps, so it's 8. Um, let's see. The ECM, engine, throttle control, um, those are both worth uh, 15 amps apiece. And my battery is dying on my meter. And uh, so my my current load with those two is approximately 24 amps. If I talk about my uh, heated seats and the heated mirror system, there's another 15 each. So another 24 is an hour at 48 plus the uh, extra eight. So we're at 56. Uh, we've got fans. Those are 40 amps. So 10% of 40 is. Uh, We could use the VAT40 and put the green amp clamp and attach it to the cable that comes off the back here and then goes over to a junction block, but nonetheless, we could evaluate the actual output of this and then put a load against the battery system with the VAT40's um, load knob and then basically put as much as we want against it to evaluate it. So we would put all of the load rating that this thing can handle against it and make sure that it can still produce 12.6 volts or higher. Um, the deal is, though, we don't want to do that very long because it does make this guy work pretty hard. And we're dealing with brushes and slip rings, and we're dealing with a device that's converting electricity into magnetism. And uh, during that process, it generates a large amount of heat, so we wouldn't want to do that for very long. Usually it's about 5 seconds, maybe 10 seconds, and uh, you would evaluate it and see what you get. So. Um, I hope that that illustrates what you can do with your own vehicles just to simply say, hey, my car it seems like it's starting poorly after I drive it. Let's just see what the alternator can produce. Obviously, we don't want it to be at 12.6. That's what your battery starts out at. So when we talk about um, just doing a voltmeter type test to evaluate your battery, it should be producing 13.5 at a minimum and then up to nearly 15 volts on some vehicles. It all depends on its purpose and the amount of electronics that the alternator is built to support. Now, another point that a lot of people bring up in class is, well, what if I put in a big amplifier and I put in a uh, you know, CD unit or some sort of uh, stereo system and big speakers and subwoofers and all that stuff? Um, what do I got to do with my electrical system then? And the answer is, you need to beef it up. So let's say you're driving a little crappy Honda Civic, and that Honda Civic, you've got huge speakers in it. And by using those huge speakers and the amplifier and everything that supports it, you would need to have an adequate electrical system to support that system. So you need to know what the maximum rated output is of that system. That might mean doing a little bit of math. So your amplifier is gonna consume X amount of uh, voltage, and it's gonna consume an X amount of uh, amperage, but usually they're rated in watts. So when we talk about watts, it's voltage times amperage. So we can actually figure out how much voltage it is uh, just by simply saying, you know, 1500 watts divided by how many volts you're producing in, during operation. It'll tell you what its rated voltage is, which is probably gonna be 13 and a half. And so you just take that 1500 divided by 13 and a half, and it tells you how much amperage you would be consuming. So um, you're talking about 100 amps, that's roughly how much that system would be drawing to operate those big subwoofers. So most small cars, like my Saturn over there, I think that's an 80 amp output alternator. And so when we talk about uh, beefing up the system, that might mean running a bigger alternator. That might mean that you have to get some sort of adapter or bracket system to be able to handle a bigger alternator that's not meant for that vehicle. It might even mean running dual alternators and double your battery size so you can actually handle those huge power draws hundreds of amps at a time um, in order to operate that system. Now we're talking pretty extreme systems but seems like most people are interested in the extreme not the mundane. So 
that's what you're talking about when you start adding more electrical accessories and uh, electronic devices or bigger stereos. You need a charging system that's capable of maintaining a higher load against the vehicle. And uh, that's done different ways. Bigger alternators, more alternators. Um, sometimes people just run with a couple batteries. And the battery idea is that it just has a bigger uh, pot, if you will, of voltage. And then when you dip the voltage out of there, the amperage out of that battery, it doesn't uh, affect the main system as much because it's a, basically a big vat or a bowl of amperage availability and you can just kind of take bigger doses out of it without it affecting the rest of the system. It's kind of a band-aid if running double batteries in a normal charging system um, and it will eventually eat down your system to the point where you might not start when you go to go out of, to get your car from the store. So just keep that in mind. Um, bigger alternator is really what you need if you're running a big stereo system or lots of lights or you know running several light bars or uh, you know, KC lights or something like that. You need more power to support that system. So I hope this video was informative. I hope that, uh, you know, we talked about some of the details about what we need to look for. Some of that stuff's related to basic maintenance, like checking belts and tensioners and stuff like that. But other things like just understanding how you can check this without doing a full uh, buying a VAT 40 or maybe your vehicle stranded and you can't get it to AutoZone where they offer free battery tests. I don't know what your circumstance is, but um, this is a quick and easy way of using just a basic voltmeter to check for starter, or um, to check for alternator health. So just make sure that uh, if you are doing it, you know what the target values are. 12.6 before you start for a fully charged battery. You're looking at at least a volt on top of that while it's running, 13.6 or more. And then on high-end systems with a lot of potential loads, you might be pushing 14, 14 and a half, maybe even close to 15 in this case. Um, there was one car I worked on, it was a BMW X5, and that vehicle, when it was actually running, it produced more than 15 volts at certain points in time. So it was producing a lot of power. Um, and rightfully so, those things had like 15 computers operating all the time, everything was power, heated seats, ventilated seats, heated steering wheel, all that stuff. It's just a lot more loads against the system that need to be maintained by the alternator. So that's it. I hope this lesson was uh, educational and informative. See you guys soon.